Hello, and welcome back to my channel. As I promised at the end of my previous video, because um, today and um, yesterday, I'm um, July 17th and 18th of 2022, are the 104th anniversary of the murder of Russia's last imperial family. Um, not only I'm um, Nicholas II, his wife, and their five children, but also I'm um, six people attached to the family and a number of um, extended relatives as well in um, Alapayevsk, Siberia. Unfortunately, many people don't know too much about the latter group who were murdered on the second date. But anyway, I'm going to be I'm reading the long free verse poem, which opens the alternative history, which I released on the 100th anniversary of the Romanov's assassination in um, 2018. By the way, um, Romanov is the proper Russian pronunciation. Romanov is an English um, mispronunciation. I realize Romanov is more much more widely used in the English speaking world, but I'm because I'm, you know, a perfectionist and such, and I really care about, you know, Russian linguistic purity and such, I will always say I'm Romanov, sorry, not sorry, if you think that makes me a pretentious twit. And so anyway, this is going to be mostly on like a photo slide of these people as I'm talking about them. After the poem, I'll be going into a little bit about each of the other people and as well, and it's the text is primarily I'm um, cobbled together from some stuff I've written on Instagram over the years when I've featured them on their um, yard site, some death anniversaries. And so anyway, let's just get down with it. Oh, but first I would like to just mention a little bit about something I wrote on Instagram once and probably on my blog as well. I really wish more people passionate about this subject would take a more nuanced view of both the people and history involved. On the one hand, we have people, many of whom, possibly because of a certain cartoon movie from the 90s, seem to be teen girls, who romanticize, idealize, and wax nostalgic about the imperial family because of the horrific way in which they were murdered, the love story of Nicholas and Alexandra, which was very beautiful, like I can't deny that, and how gorgeous their kids were, and as well as, you know, how, like, well and, like, thoroughly they documented their lives. Many times you feel as if you know a famous person, even if he or she lived, like, a long time before you did, because, you know, there's just, like, so much writing about their lives. For example, you know, their diaries, um, letters, like, first-hand accounts from, accounts from friends and relatives and tons and tons of photographs, so you kind of feel like you know these people because there's so much wide, in, widely available information about them, and you can kind of almost feel like you're friends with these people, so I do kind of understand where those people are coming from. I did kind of fall into that trap a little bit when I was, like, 15, 16 years old, somewhere in there, because obviously that's particularly when you're a teenager and you're impressionable and that's kind of the way you feel. And I and I can kind of like understand how these um, teen fangirls are feeling, but I'm sorry if I'm rambling off topic by this point. But on the other hand, we have people who think they were pure evil and deserve to die since they were obscenely wealthy, out of touch with ordinary Russians, terrible rulers, and dynasts, because, you know, God forbid someone be born into, like, a royal or imperial family that makes them just, you know, pure evil by their accident of birth. We can both feel great sorrow for their cruel deaths and appropriately memor memorialize them and point out critical flaws in the Russian Empire without making them seem either pure saints or pure antagonists. And while obviously um, neither Christianity nor um, Orthodox Christianity is my own personal religion. I do kind of religion. I do kind of like agree with people who feel there was a kind of like a political motivation for canonizing pretty much everyone who was murdered on both on July 17th and 18th because these people weren't particularly, you know, saintly in their lives. I'm not saying they were like horrible people, obviously, either, but they just, you know, weren't were not what I would really consider martyrs. They weren't like murdered because of their religious faith and like yeah I, I understand like some of them might have been you know trying to cross themselves at the moment they were murdered but that also doesn't automatically make them you know martyrs but that's a whole subject for a whole other topic and you know just a whole can of worms and as some people might know the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia has you know been kind of using these people's remains as a political football for years since they were discovered in the 90s demanding all these like, DNA tests over and over again because they just don't want to accept this was really the family in the grave in there as as far as I know like the last I heard it might have changed in the last few years they're still um denying um, Anastasia and Alexeya a proper burial because they're saying oh we don't really know these were the people in the grave but anyway I'm just gonna read the long free verse poem which opens the book and there were um tears pouring down my face as I wrote it in um November 2014 believe it or not I'm not like 100% of the time you know like a humorless stone face Alexei Nikolaevich Romanov Last Tsarevich of Russia, the boy who never became Tsar, the sickly child who slowly became stronger, with fewer injuries as he got older, lived 13 years, 11 months, and 6 days. That's not a full life, not even half a life. A beautiful, innocent child just starting to become a young man, 
frozen in time, forever 13, robbed of his life for the crime of having been born royalty, to the wrong parents, at the wrong time, in the wrong place. The soulless murderer saw only someone from the ruling class who deserved to be shot down like a wild animal, unworthy of life, not a beautiful boy who'd barely lived. How do you pack an entire lifetime of experiences and memories into only 13 years, 11 months, six days? So many lessons yet to learn, experiences yet to have, books yet to read, music yet to hear, films yet to see, a first love never to have, children never to be born, the experience of a grown-up lover denied, so much love, compassion, intelligence, strength yet to give and develop. He could have beaten the odds and lived into adulthood, found the love of a compassionate Tsaritsa who loved and accepted him just as he was, fathered healthy heirs, become Russia's most modern, enlightened, beloved Tsar, his whole reason for ruling shaped by love and compassion, his memories of suffering, the eternal outsider looking in, forced into a quiet, interior life of the mind to preserve his precarious life as long as possible. But instead, the forces of evil decided he must die in the most horrific way possible, even denied dignity and death, dumped in the woods, burnt, hacked up, doused with gasoline and sulfur, the location of his remains known only to God for 90 years, still denied a funeral. How can someone who only lived 13 years, 11 months, 6 days, have ever done anything so abominable he deserved that? But I decided he must live. So many decades later, this beautiful, innocent boy from the other world lodged himself in my heart and soul, haunting me, whispering to me, compelling me to give him the happy ending he was denied in this lifetime, entrusting me with the belief he would have become a wonderful Tsar, an exceptional adult man, someone full of strength, compassion, love, who would have beaten so many other people's dire what-if predictions and lived well into adulthood. No one will ever know now what might have been. No one ever does. That's what's so haunting and heartbreaking about the death of anyone in the prime of life. But in my beautiful dream, he earned his place in history as Tsar Alexei the Savior. The forces of good and light defeated the forces of evil and darkness. And in real life, before Alyosha died, Alyosha lived. To the dead we owe honesty, respect, love, dignity. The kindness to the dead can never be repaid and could never have an ulterior motive. Most of all, we must remember the dead as they were in life, for the fact that they lived, not that they died. And Alexei lived. Now I'm going to go through the people who were murdered. For the um, first group, I'm going to be starting in age order from Nicholas and going down to um, Alexei. And then I'm going to try to mostly go in age order for the group in Alapayevsk. And unfortunately, the only photos or the images we have at all of any sort of one of the People murdered at Alapayevsk, um, Grand Duke Sergei's secretary, Fyodor Semyonovich Remez, comes from um, two icons which were painted um, long after the fact, so hopefully, we, eventually, someday we might find out, you know, more about him, like his birth date and actual photographs of him. But anyway, like, I don't really need to explain, you know, much biographical information about Nicholas, because pretty much everyone knows about him. He's one of, you know, the most famous Ru Russian czars ever, but, you know, I'm just, you know, going to put, you know, like the pictures of them up as I'm narrating them. So again, this will primarily be a, a photo slideshow. So Nicholas was born on the 6th of May, 1868 in the old style. And the new style was the 18th of May. That's a whole like bloated subject for a whole other topic. But you know, the Gregorian and the Julian calendars were um, 13 years out of sync by the 20th century. And I'm um, 12 years out of sync during the 19th century. And Russia finally adopted the um, Gregorian calendar um, in 1917, I believe it was very late. 1917. And so like the dates I'm going to be giving for both are the new style and the old style, unless of course they were born outside of Russia, which had long since been using the Gregorian calendar. History might have gone so much differently and more happily if Nicholas hadn't been compelled onto the throne so young and unexpectedly, 
or even if his uncle Nixa and not his father Alexander III had become czar. And that's like, Nixa was like a liberal reformer, like totally progressive, cut in the same reforming cloth as his um, father Alexander II, but unfortunately he got sick and died young before he could have any heirs or even become married. And, and Alexander he said the third did become, you know, Russia's um, peace-loving czar, not peace, he, because he, you know, kept Russia out of all wars and was known as, you know, the Iron Czar because he was so strict and stuff. Obviously, of course, he was like a raging anti-Semite and I cannot support him at all for that. But he was, you know, a great husband and father and he did a lot of good for, you know, keeping Russia out of war instead of like doing the opposite like Nicholas. Like he was like just like the model of ruling and stuff. And I wish, you know, Nicholas had kind of like copied that or he had like taught and guided his heir better because Nicholas was not, you know, at all cut out for the throne. And this is um, Empress Alexandra of Russia, who was born on Princess Victoria Alex Helena Luisa Beatrice of Hesse and by Rhine on um, the 6th of June, 1872. And she really did not have a happy life at all. She was, you know, like kind of messed up on multiple levels, like long before she even met Nicholas or became the empress. And unfortunately, there's, you know, a lot of misogyny when people say, oh, she messed up the Russian empire all by herself. And she had ulterior motives, motives for doing this. And she was just, you know, like a horrible person. Let's point fingers on her and not, you know, like trying to judge her positively at all, you know. And it's, as I said, it's easy to point fingers and blame people from the comfort of historical hindsight, but much harder to dig a little deeper to discover this poor woman was clearly unwell on multiple levels for a very long time, even before she unexpectedly became empress so young. People talk like Alex did certain things to maliciously and deliberately damage her adoptive country when she was only acting in a way which seemed good to her at the time and given her like shattered mental state as well. She clearly could have benefited from, you know, a lot of therapy and drugs if she had lived in the modern era. Who knows how things might have been differently then. And regardless of how you personally feel about her, she didn't deserve to be murdered so cruelly. It's easy to cast blame and point fingers from a comfortable distance, but this poor woman had a sad, difficult life long before she became empress. Alex clearly wasn't well on any level. Just look at how many tragedies and unpleasant situations were visited upon her. The death of her mother and little sister from diphtheria, the pa pain of tragedy from losing her one brother to hemophilia, her father's remarriage to a woman no one approved of, and who was also a morganatic wife, I believe, and the subject, subsequent annulment under great familial pressure, in-laws who never wanted her to marry into the family to begin with, being immediately thrust into the role of empress to a huge empire she never understood, versus having a long adjustment period, like her mother-in-law, who was totally beloved by the Russian people even after she became the Dowager Empress, the insane pressure to produce a boy child in an empire which never saw fit to relax its strict semi salic inheritance laws, being hated for daring to have four girls in a row, having a hemophiliac son and knowing she had made him sick because it was from her family history, not Nicholas's, the constant fear of losing her only boy and heir to the throne, and lots of physical and mental unwellness on top of all that. Alex was not one of the greatest villains of all time, despite all the disastrous decisions she made. She never acted in a deliberate, calculating manner to try to destroy her adoptive country and lead to her own murder. This is um, their oldest child, um, Grand Duchess Ikol Il Olga Nikolaevna, who was born on the 3rd of November, 1895, Old Style, and the 15th of November, New Style. She was said to be the most intelligent of the five imperial children, albeit not always best served by the tutors her parents chose. Unfortunately, that was one of like all, another like bad decision they made. They weren't like really generally choosing the greatest tutors who could like shape their children's intelligence and teach them things they really deserved to learn in that era. Had someone, anyone, made a move towards modernizing the Russian Empire by relaxing the beyond draconian Pauline laws to allow women to inherit the throne, history might have gone so much differently. And yes, I know they technically weren't barred from ruling, but it was nearly impossible when the laws dictated all male dynasts had to be dead or disqualified first before, God forbid, a woman could take up the throne. And um, Tsar Paul, um, Tsar Pavel, who really, really hated his mother, Catherine the Great, he made these laws on purpose to get back at her. He wanted to make sure no woman ever ruled Russia again. He's one of my least favorite czars, but again, that's a topic for a whole other video. And in my um, alternative History, Olga marries her second cousin, Prince Konstantin Konstantinovich the Younger, who had a crush on her in real life. They have seven children, five of whom live to adulthood. Their first two boys, Sava and Yulian, died of hemophilia-related injuries in early childhood. Their oldest daughter, Zoya, distinguishes herself as a sniper during 
World War II and um, participates in the mission which um, takes down Eichmann and um, part four. I was like really, really fun to write that chapter, like, you know, this like total villain like, getting what's coming to him. And their oldest surviving son, Zahar, a pacifist, helps with leading people, many people out of fascist countries and to safety in midway points because um, Zahar Alexei is like busily rescuing almost all the Jews of occupied Europe and other people in danger as well during war. And, you know, like just doing all these things, you know, like bring them to safety and keep them in, you know, like safe, neutral houses in the meantime before it's, you know, safe to like officially come to Russia. That was, you know, just one of the main reasons I was inspired to write this story. His, their second surviving son, Raphael, a hemophiliac, joins the military near the very end of the war and helps with radio code, thus enabling the capture of public enemy number one. And he's captured alive, by the way, and is going to stand trials for his, you know, horrible, horrible war crimes. It's not depicted in the book, but you know it's coming up because, like, he's totally in custody and they're making sure he doesn't die because he's so sick. You know, he's got to stand trial because he's the star witness. Though I always felt the most super-rational soul connection to Alexei, out of the five imperial children, Olga has nevertheless always been the daughter I felt most drawn to. True to her real-life nature, she's moody in the book, feels everything deeply, and falls into depressive moods. To save her from having a nervous breakdown and becoming totally catatonic during the German invasion in World War II, Constantine sends her and the younger children to safety in Siberia. Now, this is the second daughter, Grand Duchess Tatyana Nikolaevna, who was born on the 29th of May, 1897, old style, and the 11th of June, new style. In the alternative history, she attends nursing school after her rescue, and she was a very, very distinguished nurse in real life, and she thrives in this career, even during the darkest days of, seeds, of the siege during World War II. She marries her also rescued, first cousin once removed, Prince Vladimir Pavlovich Paley, and they have five children, three of whom survived childhood. Their two younger boys, Yosef and Zosim, die of hemophilia-related injuries. Firstborn Pavel, named for his paternal grandfather, served with great courage and distinction during World War II, and oldest daughter Barbara becomes a nurse like Tatyana. True to how she was in real life, I depicted Tatyana as, a, as beautiful, elegant, a total clothes horse with impeccable taste in fashion and a penchant for design clothes herself, and naturally regal. Her outfits, jewelry, accessories, and hairstyles are always gorgeous and flattering. I also depicted her as a loyal, dutiful, and responsible person she was in real life. And many people might not realize this because of it's like totally switched because of a certain person's um, infamous pretending act. But in her actual lifetime, Tatyana was by far the most famous and popular of Nicholas II's daughters. And also, contrary to what many seemingly predominantly teenage girl fans, sorry, not sorry, on social media think, there is zero documentary evidence she was ever called Tatya. That nickname arose on unscholarly fan sites. Now all these kids who don't know any better unquestionably adopt it. By the way, it's really creepy to call total strangers, historical figures no less, by the most intimate forms of their names, especially names they never used in life. And obviously there were many people in the Romano family and also like their extended cousins across Europe who were well known by like certain nicknames like um, Bimbo, Ella, Mish, mish, you know, like ducky, things like that. And like even like serious biographers use those names because they were just, you know, so widely known. It wasn't like, you know, a, a family secret. Only the family was allowed to call them, although obviously in more formal circumstances, you would use the full names. But why would you use them? Nickname this. There's no evidence this person went by in real life. I mean, in the alternative history, they do call one another by like, nicknames like, you know, Tanya, Olya, like Manya, Masha, things like that. Because, you know, many people do like in private life, they'll call one another nicknames, even, though, even if they might not particularly use those names and letters and such. But these, like, nicknames, like, these fangirls have made up on, you know, Instagram and weird social media sites. Where is the, show me the evidence that they were, you know, calling one another, like, Tatya, Olishka, and, like, Mashka in real life. That's, you know, again, totally creepy. I could rant all day about that. And, um, even during the darkest days of the siege, she keeps up with her hospital work very valiantly during um, World War II and is joined by her oldest daughter, Barbaria, who is also a nurse. And as I mentioned, I'm just as in real life, she cuts a very regal, elegant figure with a gorgeous, well-maintained household in Yelagin Palace, gourmet luncheons and dinners, and the most stylish clothes. She only loses her reserve once, near the end of the book, when first-born son Pavel, her only surviving son, comes into her hospital severely wounded. Now, this is um, Grand Duchess Maria Nikolaevna, who was a third-born daughter. She was born the 14th of June, 1899, old style, and the 27th of June, new style. My alternative history, she marries her second cousin, Prince Igar Konstantinovich, five years her senior, 
and they have a very happy marriage and 11 children. She wanted to marry a Russian soldier and have a big family in real life, so I granted her wish. Since she was such a sweet person in real life and wanted a big family so badly, yet knowing she was a hemophilia carrier, which is um, borne out by genetic evidence since, like on her bones and such, I gave her eight girls to only three boys and only killed off one of her boys. Her youngest child, Oleg, a surprise born during World War II, is a healthy boy. Oleg is conceived during a short visit Igar makes to the besieged capital during the war. During, it's instead of, you know, the real-life siege of Leningrad, it's the siege of St. Petersburg in the book, because obviously the city didn't change its name in an alternative history. And um, Oleg turns out to be the healthy boy Maria and Igar saw, thought they would never be blessed with. You know, and as I said, since Maria was such a sweet person and knowing she was a hemophilia carrier in real life, and there's also documentary evidence she, like, bled more than usual during surgical procedures, which is in addition to the testing on her bones, so I gave her almost nothing but girls, and only killed off one of her boys. I just didn't think she could have, you know, handled it if she had lost all these different boys, so, like, she will have less, you know, fear of hemophilia if she's, like, only, uh, almost nothing but girls. In 1930, Maria and Igar opened a children's emporium, emporium on Nevsky Prospect in St. Petersburg, which is a very famous on promenade, named for their deceased oldest child, Leonid dies of hemophilia-related complications after a car accident in the Crimea in 1929. Though Maria thrives in her role as wife and mother, she also derives great pleasure from running this big store full of toys, games, sweets, and other merchandise for children. Now you are looking at the most um, famous of Nicholas II's some children, Grand Duchess Anastasia Nikolaevna, who was born on the 5th of June, 1901, Old Style, and the 18th of June, New Style. I'm not shy about admitting I was an Anastasian for almost 20 years, I even wrote a research paper my junior year of high school, so-called proving Anna Anderson was Anastasia. It was so convincing, my teacher said I made a very good case. Years later, I read on um, Resurrection of the Romanovs, which I reread re again a few years ago, and I'm still like hoping to do that during the remainder of this month, a compare and contrast between that and um, Peter Kurth's biography, Anastasia, the Riddle of Anna Anderson. And I could no longer deny the reams of evidence blowing apart this faker's claim. I was stunned at how much false information I had uncritically accepted and how much was misreported, misrepresented, or outright lied about from the beginning. This goes far beyond DNA. In my alternative history, Anastasia marries her second cousin, Prince Roman Petrovich, who survived in real life, five years her senior, and they have a very strong marriage. I couldn't figure out what to do with her at first, perhaps as a reaction against her massive overrepresentation in film and literature. Like, seriously, the world does not need yet another book about Anastasia. Sorry, not sorry. She barely spoke at all in part one, barely says more than five words at a time. Then I hit upon the idea of her being so traumatized by seeing her parents murdered and narrowly escaping the firing squad herself. She completely shuts down and becomes the opposite of her former vivacious self, going into total shell shock and a catatonic depressive state, the complete opposite of her former talkative, playful personality. When Rahman visits on Orthodox Christmas 1919, her first orphan Christmas, to return Alexei's beloved cats Koltka and Zubrovka, he offers to take Alexei ice skating, and Anastasia asks if she can come too. They get to talking during the sleigh ride there, and have begun falling for one another by the end of the day. Anastasia's uncle, Grand Duke Mikhail Alexandrovich, who has now become their guardian in the region for Alexei, notices the miraculous, magical, obvious change, and encourages Rahman to keep visiting. He knows that's the only husband for her and approves the official start of their courtship after Anastasia turns 18 and finishes her education. Anastasia and Roman later open a sports club on their estate in Znamenka and allow people from all walks of life to use it, not just, you know, upper class swells. Athletics are the perfect way for her to channel all that sorrow and anger into something healthy and constructive. During World War II, they let the many Jewish refugee children use it. Many of the children use the sporting club to help with their own traumas. As Anastasia tells an angry, depressed girl who initially refuses to participate, athletics help to recover her mind, and all her bad feelings were channeled into sports. If not for Franziska Shanskovska's decades-long pretending act, which she very ma well may have believed by the end after so long of claiming it over 60 years, she would have remained the least known. Had she been rescued in real life, or become, or had the revolution never happened, she probably wouldn't have become much more famous either. She probably wouldn't have married, you know, like a firstborn son or heir to the throne either, just you know, like a more minor prince farther down the line. Now, this is the star of my alternative history, Cesarevich Alexei Nikolaevich, who was born the 30th of July, 1904, old style, and the 12th of August, new style. From the time I first heard his story, 
I felt a super rational soul connection to this beautiful boy, and I got the idea to write an alternative historical saga in which he is rescued and becomes the greatest Tsar in history. If I didn't give him the happy ending he was cheated out of in real life, I would have regretted it forever. One has to be careful not to stray too far from real personalities when writing about actual historical figures, even in alternative history. But there wasn't a true radical transformation if you know anything about Alexei. He was described as golden-hearted, with a very strong sense of right and wrong, compassionate, kind-hearted, sympathetic to anyone's suffering, inspired by his own experience of suffering with hemophilia. Those traits are magnified after his traumatic experience of narrowly escaping the firing squad and quickly realizing he has to be a much different kind of czar if he wants the people to love him and for Russia to move into the modern era. And while a hemophiliac's lifespan was often rather short in that era, it wasn't an automatic early death sentence if one were very careful and had excellent doctors. Alexei's uncle, Grand Duke Mikhail Alexandrovich, his guardian and regent, institutes a lot of new tough love restrictions and gets a new team of doctors. As much as Alexei resents this at first, especially being forced to wear calipers all the time, he ultimately realizes it's for his own good, better a long, relatively healthy life, certain restrictions, than a shortened life without any regard for his condition. And for whatever reason, many non-Russians, including myself once upon a time, used the legally incorrect title Tsarevich to refer to the heir to the throne. In 1721, Peter the Great discontinued the title of Tsar in favor of Imperator, Emperor, Thus, the title of Tsarevich for the heir apparent or presumptive fell into disuse, as did the, did the title Tsarevna, except for Tsar Ivan V's daughters, one of whom became Empress Anna. From this point on, the Tsar's daughters were titled Tsarevna, later Grand Duchess, the Russian form of which actually translates as Grand Princess. Starting in 1773, Tsarevna became the title for the wife of the Tsarevich. And it's like totally garbage and ahistorical when I see like so-called historical books or like historical fantasy calling the Tsar's daughter Tsarevna. Like, what the hell? How much research do you actually freaking do if you think that was a title being used still in the 20th century? In 1762, upon the ascension of Tsar Peter III to the throne, he created the title Tsarevich for his son Pavel. In 1797, the title became law. The Tsarevich title, from then on out, merely referred to any son of a Tsar, not just the heir apparent or presumptive. Many non russophiles innocently use the title Tsarevich and have no idea that Tsarevich even exists, but people in Imperial Russia certainly only refer to their heirs by the proper legal title, Tsarevich. In the case of Alexei, the last heir to the Russian throne, both titles are technically correct since he was the only boy in the family, but no one in Russia ever called him Tsarevich. And these are the four servants I'm showing who were murdered with the Romanovs on July 17th of 1918. Um, Dr. Yevgeny Sergeyevich Botkin, who was born on the 27th of May, 1865, old style on the 8th of June. New style who refused to leave the emperor until the end, no matter what. He just wanted to serve Nicholas to the end of his life because he was that devoted. This is the, the Alexandra's last remaining lady-in-waiting, Anna Stepanovna Demidovna, who was born on the 14th of January, 1878, old style, 26th of January, new style. Their cook, Ivan Mikhailovich Haritonov, who was born the 2nd of June, 1870, old style, and 14th of June, new style. And their um, footman, Alo Aloisi Yegorovich Troop, sometimes called him Alexei, the footman, who was born on the 5th of April, 18. 56, he was, I believe he was born in Germany or Prussia, so he wouldn't have had like an old and new cell date from the Russian Empire. And these are the people who were murdered on the 18th of July, 1918, though unfortunately most took several days to die and their like agony was prolonged even further. They were like they were thrown down a mine shaft bound and gagged and had some grenades thrown after them and there was also a lot of water in the mine shaft. It was just like an absolutely horrible death. Some people reported they heard praying and singing coming from it for several days afterward. Now this is um Empress Alexandra's um older sister, um Princess Elizabeth, who is um known as Ella in the family, Princess of Hesse and Bahrain, later um Grand Duchess Elizaveta Fyodorovna of Russia and is now the new martyr Elizabeth, who was she, and she became a nun after her um, husband, um, Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich, was assassinated. And then Sergei was an anti-Semite. He kind of, you know, got what was coming to him. He was just, you know, like a horrible, like, reactionary as well. But anyway, and one of her um, fellow nuns was also murdered with her, um, Varvara Alexeyevna Yakovlevna. And, like, she was, um, Ella was instantly popular when she came to Russia, unlike her little sister. And, oh, by the way, um, Ella was born on the 1st of November, 1864. She was instantly popular among the Russian court and imperial family after she like moved there to marry um, Grand Duke Sergei and join the family. 
And when he, um, Sergei was assassinated in 1905, she renounced her former high society life and became a committed nun. This wasn't just, you know, like something done for fun or to fill the time or like to look good with the charity project. She was genuinely committed to being a nun. Though no one survived to tell the tale, evidence suggests she helped the other people thrown down the mine shaft in Alapayevsk, such as bandaging their wounded heads. She and the others could also be heard praying, as I mentioned. And the Alapayevsk Martyrs were um, found by the White Army like a few days, a week later. Unfortunately, they were all dead by that point, but they were able to get, you know, proper burials. And they were um, taken to um, Beijing, China, and buried in a Russian Orthodox cemetery. And um, Ella and Sister Varvara were um, moved to Jerusalem in 1921. When I'm, there, when I'm there next, I would love to, like, visit their graves and pay my respects. Um, and today they're at them, the Church of Mary Magdalene in um, Gethsemane. But sadly, the Beijing cemetery was turned into a parking lot in 1986, so the graves of the other people murdered to Alapayevsk you know, no longer even have like proper gravestones or just under a parking lot being really disrespected in them. This is um, Sister Varvara Alexeyevna Yakovlevna. She was born about um, 1850. We don't really know much about her. At least I haven't done like research on her for a while. Maybe there's new stuff since. And this is Grand Duke Sergei Mikhailovich, who was born the 25th of September, 1869, old style, and the 7th of October, new style. He was the only one who knew they were being taken to be murdered and tried to resist or escape several times. The captors finally bound his hands to prevent this from happening again, despite Sergei repeatedly pleading with them that he was intelligent and cultured, not a dangerous criminal who was deemed automatically guilty by mere virtue of his high birth. They didn't care he and his siblings were raised in Georgia instead of St. Petersburg, and as a result were well known and sometimes infamously so for being like way more relaxed and progressive than most other Romanovs. Like some of the people leading the charge to tell Nicholas to like, dude, come into the 20th century already were from um, Sergei's branch of the family because they had been like raised in an environment that was just like so much more like progressive and relaxed, not this like strict old school, like let's pretend it's still the 18th century era of kings in St. Petersburg. Now this is um, Prince Yolan Konstantinovich, who was born the 23rd of June, 1886, old style, and the 5th of July, new style. And he was originally born with the title of Grand Duke, but like when he was, I think, only a few days old, his title was like demoted down to Prince. He was the first child affected by a new law stipulating only children and grandchildren of a Tsar can bear the title Grand Duke or Duchess, a title which, as I mentioned, truly translates as Grand Prince or Princess. It was meant to cut down on the amount of people drawing a salary from the imperial treasury, though these lesser-ranked people were still in line for the throne, although much, much farther down. Yuan was known as very modest, quiet, religious, and good-natured. Some people thought he might become a monk, but he surprised everyone by marrying Princess Yelena of Serbia in 1911, and Yelena actually went to medical school to become a doctor, which like really unusual in that era, particularly for a Romanov woman, like, you know, getting a higher education and wanting a career beyond like being like a wife and mother in like high society matron. Their children, Vasivalad and Yekaterina, were the last imperial children born in Russia. Yelena tried to negotiate for, for Ioan's release, but this tragically was never successful. She and her children managed to escape the new USSR before they could be imprisoned and murdered too. And uh, as I mentioned, like he, Ioan and all the other um, people who were killed at Alapayevsk in real life are rescued and he and his wife Yelena returned to Pavlovsk's palace. True to life, he remains very religious and serious. And, you know, they have two more children in the alternative history in real life. They only had the two. And now um, this is um, Prince Konstantin Konstantinovich. The younger his um, father was, um, I'm sorry, Grand Duke Konstantin Konstantinovich. That's why they're called, like, the older and the younger in him. He and his, um, all of his um, brothers, except for, like, the very youngest who were too young for the army, they served with great courage and distinction in the front lines in World War One in the Ismailovsky regiment, and they were known from being one of the more humble, fairly normal branches of the Romana family, so example, no real scandals, morally upright lives, not pursuing an obscenely extravagant lifestyle with their millions of rubles, and like flitting back and forth between like 10 freaking palaces and yachts throughout the year. Constantine was called Kostya, and in my alternative history, he marries his second cousin, Grand Duchess Olga Nikolaevna, whom he had a crush on in real life, and he makes his home with her at Puflovsk Palace, which um, his family branch lived at in real life. And he was a sweet, shy, silent person who longed for his own family after seeing the happiness of his oldest two siblings, Ioan and Tatyana. Sadly, he never got to know this joy. When the White Army found the bodies of the Alapayevsk martyrs, his mouth was stuffed with dirt, trying to stave off his hunger. And it's, you know, obvious in my alternative history from the time um, he and Olga first meet for their, like, attempted courtship meeting set up by um, their hit, Olga's uncle, Mikhail. It's, you know, obvious he's the only one for her. And, like, he's just, you know, knows what it takes to help to heal her wounded heart 
mind and soul, and she helps to heal him too. And they have a very happy marriage despite losing their two oldest children to hemophilia. And this is um, Prince Igor Konstantinovich, who was born the 29th of May, 1894, old cell, and the 10th of June, new style. Though he was plagued by weak lungs during his time at the front, he served very bravely and was well liked by his fellow soldiers. And he, these weren't, you know, dudes like, oh, I have like lots of money and a princely title so I can get out of serving. I'll just do a non-combatant role or serve really, really far back from the front lines. Now they put their hides on the line and served on the front lines along with like regular other guys. So that's like kind of like you can't really imagine someone doing that these days. Sadly, Egod's favorite brother, Oleg, was killed in action. And some believe this heartache led to their father's death during the war as well. My alternative history, Prince Igor marries his second cousin, Grand, Grand Duchess Maria Nikolaevna. They, like, like Olga and Constantine, they also helped to heal one another's wounded hearts, minds, and souls and have a happy life at Pavlovsk's palace with their eventual 11 children, one of whom dies of hemophilia in 1929. During World War II, Igor goes to the front as a senior military advisor. When he comes home on a brief visit, after the most precarious and narrowest of land passages is secured in the besieged, to the besieged St. Petersburg, he and Maria conceive their final child, Oleg, named for Igar's dearest brother. Knowing Maria is a hemophilia carrier, and after the devastating loss of their oldest son, Leonid, Igar and Maria both, both hope they'd continue only having girls, but Oleg turns out to be healthy, which is just a wonderful, beautiful surprise and miracle for them. Now, this is on Prince Vladimir Pavlovich Paley, who is called Volodya. He was born the 28th of December, 1896, old style, and the 9th of January, 1897, new style. He was the oldest child together of Grand Duke Pavel Alexandrovich and Olga Valerianovna Karnovich. After many years of terrible treatment on account of their morganatic marriage, Volodya's parents were finally permitted to return to St. Petersburg, and he, his mother, and his little sisters were created a prince and princesses with the surname Paley. Their style was Serene Highness. This sensitive young man was a talented, precocious poet who saw inspiration and beauty in everything, even seemingly insignificant, silly things like a blade of grass or sun shining on a rose. He showed great depth, maturity, skill, and talent for his young age. He was 13 when he started writing poetry, and he also did some translations as well of like plays and poetry. After the horrific experience of serving at the front during World War I, his poetry changed to a more serious direction, reflecting the cruelty, ugliness, suffering, devastation, destruction, and sorrow of war. Volodya's poems from this period also touch on the nurse's kindness and the deaths of his friends. Because Volodya was morganatic, he could have been spared captivity, but he bravely, wordlessly refused to deny his dear father, Grand Duke Pavel Alexandrovich. While in captivity, he lost all interest in the frivolous things he had enjoyed prior, like ballets, paintings, and music, and focused only on his faith in the real things in life. He was only 21 when he lost his life. In my alternative history, the Alapayevsk prisoners are also rescued, and Volodya marries his first cousin, once removed, Grand Duchess Tatyana Nikolaevna. They set up their household at Yelagin Palace. Some of the things he says in the earliest days of their courtship come directly from things he said in real life related to his experience in captivity and his feelings about everything speaking to him in poetry. Volodya goes on to write much more poetry, some of it reflecting the life-changing experience of imprisonment, coming so close to death, his miraculous rescue, his second chance at life, and the new, lo new love he's found with Tatyana. So thank you very much for listening to the end. This turned out much longer than I had expected. I do have a prior video where I talk about a lot of background information about this book, maybe I'll redo that video at some point because it doesn't have a lot of views yet. And but hopefully you enjoyed seeing all the beautiful pictures and learning more about these people, including the extended members of the Romanov family. If you've not already, please um, consider um, subscribing. And I also love to see comments like how else can I build friendships with people if you're not commenting. And I also help comments help me to build my channel and learn, learn you know, what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong, what you want to see more of and what you want to see less of. And I'll see you guys again very soon. Thanks again for watching. Bye.